introduce our speaker today, Jessica Lane Carmeli. Um, we're very pleased to have her with us today. Um, so Jessica, she's a perinatal epidemiologist and she's a researcher at the Institute of Social and Preventive Medicine at the University of Bern in Switzerland. She's also an honorary senior researcher fellow at the Department of Epidemiology and Stat Biostatistics at Imperial College London in the UK. Um, she runs a um, epidemiological consult consulting business and she's becoming also a birth educator, which is very exciting. Um, she lives in Switzerland with her husband and two um, little kids, which is really nice. And uh, um, we also have her website, so I'll put the link um, in just a moment. Um, yeah, so I would really like to thank you, Jessica, um, on behalf of our team to joining us today. And uh, we're very much looking forward to your lecture and the floor is now yours. Thank you. Thank you for the nice introduction and for inviting me. And I'm very excited that uh, we can all be together virtually. I am. I would love to be there in person. Um, I, I realized this week the timing would be crazy in Berlin right now. So <laughs> it might be a little busy there. So it's it's good to meet in a virtual space. And hopefully I can meet others in, the, in real life at future conferences. And um, yeah, this is great. So um, the title of my talk is uh, Birth is Not Binary. It's uh, Avoiding a Major Pitfall in Perinatal Epidemiology. And so just a few caveats. Um, I think probably when I was invited to give a talk, it was probably based on the fact that I've been doing causal inference uh, research in the last decade and that uh, I've also worked on the exposome. So I've attended a lot of causal inference meetings and met various people from the, um, the group. And um, yeah, this is kind of not that. So I, I hope that everyone who's expecting equations um, is not let down. And those who hate equations, maybe you're a bit excited. So uh, it's there. I'm going to talk about a lot of conceptional things and something that I've just recently discovered in, in my work after working in perinatal epidemiology for the last decade. So I'm going to jump right in. So just as a um, as a, a, a acknowledgement of gender diversity and inclusion, um, so from the title of my talk, you could think uh, maybe I'm talking about gender diversity, but um, that's not the binary that I'm talking about. But I just want to say that studies discussed and cited in this talk, they do not necessarily reflect gender diverse people's birthing experiences. And so when I discuss past research, I will use the terms that the researchers used in those studies. So this is typically women and mothers, but that we must recognize and include gender diversity in perinatal epidemiology to include all childbearing people in our studies and to also use inclusive terminology. At the same time, I acknowledge that there is um, a debate about this and that it's important for cis women to not feel erased by gender inclusive terms, whether that's true or not. And thus I will use the terms that acknowledge a range of people such as women and birthing persons. So let's get into birth. So we commonly assess birth, and I mean we as in perinatal epidemiologists, but we could also look across the field of epidemiology as mode of delivery. And this is usually simply how a baby comes out. And I'm gonna give two examples, and I want us to think about how they would be categorized. So this is Tiff. Tiff goes to her 39 week appointment with her doctor, and her doctor expresses concern that her baby might be too large, and he suggests that she get an induction. Tiff is a little apprehensive because she wants to have a natural birth, an unmedicated birth. It's in her birth plan. It's what she's been expecting. And so she says, um, no, thanks. I would like to think about it. The doctor then says, well, I hope you know that your risk for, spon for, um, for other aspects increase as you go later in your pregnancy. So Tiff begins to worry about all the risk and things. She says, okay, I'll wait one week until my due date and then I'll get back to you. Her due date comes and she hasn't slept the whole week. She's worrying about the ability to, to deliver this so-called big baby and she goes in for the induction. So the induction doesn't take it first. It takes about within the 24 hour range of what's accepted. And it begins to work. She then goes into active labor and it's very painful and it does take some time for her to dilate. 
her doctors begin to worry and they give her more synthetic oxytocin to try to encourage labor to go quickly. So by this point, she's uh, been in 24 hours in the hospital, uh, hooked up to electrical fetal monitoring. There are at times where the baby's heart rate gets worrisome and she's really stressed. She hasn't eaten, she hasn't slept. And because the painful, the contractions are um, so painful from the oxytocin, the synthetic oxytocin, she gets an epidural. So this begins what's called a cascade of interventions, which I'll discuss later. Eventually, her baby is born vaginally through a forcept and through a this cascade of interventions that made her feel uncomfortable and in some ways violated. So she leaves the birthing experience feeling not so positive about her birth. And she's had a, a lot of things that have happened during this experience. But her baby is fine and healthy. Not too big, though, about seven pounds. This is Ella. Ella also gives birth at the same hospital as Tiff. Now, Ella has a midwifery care model, and her midwife allows Ella to go to 41 and a half weeks when she goes into spontaneous labor, meaning that there was no induction or medication or anything that started her labor. It started on its own. She labors at home in the comforts of her home until it's time to go into the hospital. At the hospital, she gets into the birthing pool, which she requested, and she's able to manage her pain and contractions through water and with her midwife's assistance. Her labor is a little bit long, it's about 12 hours. There's pain, but she's supported by a team and her baby's born vaginally. So are these births the same? Well, according to our medical records that we might use to analyze the data, according to many studies, they are. They're considered to be a vaginal birth despite being very, very different. So pop quiz, how do we typically measure, view, and analyze the variable of mode of delivery in perinatal epidemiology? So just something to think about. So we have two categories where we look at vaginal births versus cesarean section. Three categories where we assess spontaneous vaginal birth, assisted vaginal birth, and cesarean section. Four categories where we assess spontaneous vaginal birth, assisted vaginal birth, elected sex, cesarean section, and emergency section, or six categories. So I'll give you a clue. It's in the title of the talk. Usually birth is binary. We are looking at two categories of birth, vaginal versus cesarean. So this brings me to the first pitfall, is, which is that childbirth experiences may be categorized as similar that are in fact polar opposites, or at least different enough with our assessments. So we'll look at this with the first um, question, where we want to look at the association between mode of delivery, mostly um, we're interested in the relationship between cesarean section, and childhood obesity. So the proposed mechanism is that the vaginal microbiome protects the childhood risk of obesity. As this passage colonizes the fetus neonate with beneficial flora, and that the infant microbiomes have been found to be very different for those born vaginally versus um, born by cesarean. So the exposure here is babies born by cesarean section and babies born vaginally. And the outcome is childhood obesity. And we adjust for a set of potential confounders, such as age at delivery, breastfeeding, childhood nutrition, uh, socioeconomic status, and education at the household. And we find no association. And this is true. This, these studies have been conducted, and people have found no association. People have also found an association. So... The first problem with this is that microbiome exposure may differ greatly within the categories of both vaginal and cesarean births. And this could be based on several factors, but just a few is that vaginal deliveries do not all have the same microbiome. So routine interventions may influence the microbiome and childhood obesity. Antibiotics, and I'm just talking about vaginal deliveries in this instance, because we tend to think of antibiotics given um, when a woman has, a woman or birthing person has a cesarean section. But it's actually estimated that in many places, up to 30% of women who deliver vaginally may be given antibiotics. So this would influence the microbiome. 
but also it can influence uh, infant delivery when, when, when they're weighed, so birth weight. And this has not been explained by mode of delivery. So then if we look at those who are categorized as mode of delivery of a cesarean section, um, C-sections occurring post-labor, meaning that whether it was spontaneous or not, if a woman goes into labor um, versus having a scheduled or elective cesarean section, they have different microbiome, the infants have different microbiome exposures. And then we have uh, situations where the maternal microbiome seeding can occur for infants born via cesarean section. So this is where the woman or birthing a uh, person chooses to expose their infant to vaginal or, um, or another uh, microbiome after birth. So then if we look at other hypotheses that aren't really considered in our causal model from the previous slide, we can see that the there are other um, potential causal models, such as the effects of labor and birth. So as the birth canal stretches to accommodate a passing infant, tissues can exert mechanical pressure on the fetal lungs. This expunges the amniotic fluid found in all fetal lungs while still in utero, and it eases the respiratory transition to breathing air. And um, so this is known that some babies born via cesarean section have a higher increase for respiratory disorders at birth. We also know that respiratory distress at birth and respiratory health is associated with childhood obesity. So those who gave birth, let's say, let's just look at the cesarean section category, who had um, some labor might actually have some of this in utero, in utero ex, ex, um, ex, expunged, expunged yeah, <laughs> of the amniotic fluid. Um, then we can look at another hypothesis not captured in our causal model. Um, this is the EPIC hypothesis that's put together, that was put forth by Dr. Hannah uh, Dallin. And this hypothesis is that non-physiological interventions during the intrapartum period, so specifically the use of synthetic oxytocin, which is commonly used uh, for labor induction and also commonly used to speed up labor or if labor is a woman is la is labeled as failure to progress, meaning her cervix isn't dilating um, fast enough that they may use the synthetic oxytocin. Um, epidural and cesarean delivery may interrupt the normal stress of being born. And in this paper, they talk about how stress is a good thing. Um, we need these stresses for a baby to be born. And this results in epigenetic epigenetic modification of potential gene expression, such as those that program immune responses, and this can include weight regulation and metabolism. So implications of the findings of no association from our, our assessment is that interpreting data without the awareness of these nuances, meaning these other causal mechanisms or how you uh, would miss this by making birth binary um, through mode of delivery, they can easily lead to erroneous conclusions. And I've just highlighted one um, news article that said that there was no link between cesarean delivery and obesity. And uh, in the article, it's actually stated, so women who uh, have cesareans have nothing to worry about and um, there's no no worry about this. The in, they they alluded to saying that the increase in cesarean sections shouldn't be concerned for for um, women and their children's weight. So this can be quite a strong conclusion um, that may not be true. So is birth binary in this situation? I think not, and I'll argue in many situations it's not. So we know as all the expert ex epidemiologists that we are, that there's, um, as Altman says in this paper here, that there's a cost of dichotomizing a continuous variable where we have information that's lost. We can underestimate the extent of variation and outcome between groups. So in this situation where we have vaginal birth and cesarean section, we are assuming that only vaginal birth and C-section are the values that matter in our analyses, and thus we're not accounting for variations in births. We are also saying that all vaginal births are the same, and all cesarean sections are the same, exposure-wise. 
something with which I find completely false in probably almost any scenario. By categorizing birth as vaginal or cesarean section, we are making strong assumptions about causal mechanisms and associations. So I'll bring forth uh, my second issue um, or pitfall number two, if we want to, to call it that. Um, we are often not assessing the birthing process, especially the role of interventions and in how the woman or birthing person is made to feel. So we know that spontaneous vaginal birth rates are decreasing worldwide while cesarean delivery, instrumental births, and medical birth interventions are increasing. So interventions do what they're supposed to do. They intervene with the birthing process and are associated with, unfortunately, some adverse outcomes. So I'm just going to talk briefly about two of the major interventions, are, which are um, infusion of synthetic oxytocin and an epidural. So infusion of synthetic oxytocin can be given to induce. Um, there are other ways to perform inductions, but it's one of the most common. And just uh, a recent statistic from the UK is that um, the rate of induction in 2020, I think it was three, was 19.2% to 53.4%, depending on the location. So it's quite high. And this is this is pretty common in, in other countries as well, uh, especially Western countries. So the infusion of oxytocin and synthetic oxytocin in labor can change uter uterine contraction patterns. Mostly it makes them much stronger and faster. So this may influence uterine blood flow and maternal autom autonomic nervous system activity, potentially harming the fetus and increasing maternal pain and stress. So then usually the, the, the woman or birthing person will then get something to manage the, train, manage the pain, such as an epidural. Um, it's been reported that um, epidural use is around 30% uh, of laboring women in the UK and around 60% in the US. Uh, epidural is associated with prolonged second stage of labor, meaning that the second stage of labor um, goes longer with higher currents of mal presentations and a higher percentage of assisted vaginal births. Not to mention with some epidurals, the woman is not allowed to move around or um, which can help with positioning of the baby before birth. And often co-interventions occur. So um, there's a term called cascade of inventions, which is simply where you, uh, a woman or birthing person will receive one intervention such as uh, induction and then another intervention will occur. And this starts to cascade and cascade and cascade where the intervention given is because, because of a previous intervention. So uh, in this study by Peterson, they looked at the sequence of interpartum um, uh, interventions and they looked at how it affected delivery in, uh, in various um, birthing women. So we have to consider also unwanted interventions and the increasing incidence of obstetric violence and disrespect and abuse. So studies in the US and Canada estimate that around 60 to up to 90% of women who had planned to have a uh, physiological birth or a natural birth underwent unintended and often unwanted interventions, including induction of labor, episiotomy, instru instrumental vaginal birth, cesarean section, and among others. So um, a global estimate is that nearly half of new mothers uh, have described their birth as traumatic, and this does vary by country. Um, and for example, where I live in Switzerland, 27% of women have experienced some form of informal cohesion during childbirth. What this means is that they have been coerced into doing something that they didn't necessarily want to do. Um, and it's usually labeled as informed consent when it's actually some form of cohesion. So one study that I am uh, currently conducting is I am assessing breastfeeding barriers and facilitators during the um, COVID-19 pandemic. And one of the, the underlying questions I have is what about the role of birth? So what we, we have seen from some studies that have um, come from the, come from the pandemic is that the, the mode of birth didn't necessarily matter uh, in terms of what women actually were, were made to feel 
in their birthing experiences. And so this is um, one thing that I'm trying to examine in this study, because what I had found is that um, it's often described how women, women often describe how they felt and not necessarily if it was a, a, a vaginal or cesarean birth. So um, I'm looking at this relationship and I think it's, it's an important uh, factor to highlight too. So stay tuned there. So issue three are, is that we are categorizing this mode of delivery as a procedure and not as an outcome or a process that reflects the health of birthing women and persons or the infant. So you can see this, this little video, we're just looking at if a baby comes out of the vagina or the abdomen typically. And this can lead to ignorance of some of the larger public health issues birthing women and persons are experiencing by just focusing so much on this mode of delivery. So I'll just um, talk give this talk through this quote by this paper um, where they describe childbirth as an experience. So they say childbirth is a transitional life event. I'll add to this, no matter how it's experienced, no matter how it happens, it's the transitional life event um, that is experienced on a continuum with positive healing and empowering experiences at the one end of the spectrum and negative or even traumatic experiences at the other. So women describe dynamic experiences of labor and childbirth that are multidimensional, complex, and unique, and incorporate interrelated subject, subjective psychological and physiological processes. Studies suggest that between one and two thirds of women experience childbirth as positive, whereas up to 30% of women experience their birth as negative or even traumatic. And again, that can vary greatly by country. So also by just focusing on this mode of delivery, um, we may be missing some larger public health crises. So it's highly identified in the perinatal epidemiology uh, world that, we're, that the US is experiencing maternal health crisis. This includes increases in maternal mortality and severe maternal mor morbid morbidity with great uh, racial disparities. We also are seeing an increasing of medicalized birth in developing countries without much improvements in infant and maternal outcomes. And the COVID pandemic has been argued to be a magnifying glass for existing issues in our systems of birth. So in this paper, I'll quote, by Lelore et al. They say parental experiences highlighted how maternity care during the COVID-19 pandemic did not adhere to World Health Organization standards of quality matern maternity care. So how did we get here? And this birth is binary dilemma. <laughs> Um, so I argue that we've made strong assumptions that births are the same, whether if a baby, essentially if the baby comes out of the vagina or not. Now, this may be bio, bio, biologically or clinically well supported for reasons for categorization. I argue often it's not. Um, we often work with the data that we have. And this is and this is um, a lot of issues in, in across many fields of in epidemiology, where we force the research question to fit the data rather than finding data appropriate for the research question. We also have limited hypotheses that are too simple or based on research trends. So I think a lot of the um, cesarean section and uh, infant or child health outcomes have been really driven by this trend um, and where we're not really looking further into other aspects of birth and how that might influence um, the infant and child health outcomes, including, including the microbiome, but as I, I presented before. So we neglect the need for expertise in the area of birth and birth research methodology, such as not including a perinatal epidemiologist on a research study where you're assessing any aspect of pregnancy, birth, um, or children's health. 
We have many funding limitations. Um, we're working in academic and birthing systems that are largely shaped by medical, industrial, patriarchal, colonizing, and neoliberal paradigms, which influences our the way that we view birth, the way that we categorize birth, the way that we measure birth, and that can lead to essentialist philosophies regarding birth. So I offer a few solutions. Uh, first, that we've been here before um, and will be here again in terms of um, methodological challenges, because uh, reproductive and perinatal studies are very vulnerable to unique method methodological challenges that we're all probably very familiar with. So I think for this particular challenge, these challenges, is that we must thoroughly think through our hypotheses and assess multiple causal mechanisms. We need to view birth as a major event and assess all that that encompasses. One suggestion is to look at birth as a mixture. And I throw this out there with a caveat to look at the birth ohm under, which is kind of a variation within the exposome work. I used to do research in the exosome. We used to always joke that there's always another ohm. So we're not going to do the birth ohm. Um, please, no one do that. But let's examine birth as it is its own exosome. Like there are many, many, many factors that we can gather and look at this sort of um, holistically. So we can also look at other, some of, some of this might be to look at other aspects other than mode of delivery and intervention, such as models of care. Um, like midwifery care versus obstetric care, et cetera. So the experiences of childbirth are subjective and must be measured as such. So it's important that we start integrating qualitative and quantitative findings, which will enable a deeper understanding of the complex phenomena of birth. We need to start measuring physiological birth. And this includes um, out of hospital births, which have been increasing, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic and after. This includes home birth and birth center births. Um, and we need to try to start understanding a lot more mechanistically. So to understand and assess such as like the neurobiological basis, the hormonal blueprint of an undisturbed labor and birth. So solutions and data collection. Um, so we need to uh, have access to data and knowledge about data and the mechanisms that I have discussed amongst many others. This will require a collaboration with people who have expertise on birth, including perinatal epidemiologists. And I really, really want to highlight the greatness of midwifery researchers because they are doing a, a, an amazing job actually. And I think we can collaborate more with um, midwifery researchers to improve our perinatal epidemiological studies. So there's always been an issue of a lack of standardization with regard to some of our data that may come from birth registries. And we need to consider this when interpreting the results. Um, if we do use categories for birth, especially this binary cesarean versus vag vaginal, uh, we can use quantitative bias analysis methods to kind of estimate these systemic errors that might have occurred. Um, we can start to use multiple categories to create an ordinal nominal variable with more groups, um, five, six, or more, depending on the birth sample size and, and other things, so that loss of information can be minimized. Um, of course, this bring in, brings in more complexities for analysis. So I just highlight here a study done by uh, Dr. Peters, uh, where they were looking at um, long-term health outcomes in children, uh, based on interventions and mode of birth. So they have uh, seven categories describing birth here, which is, I think, a, a good improvement over um, the binary. So um, we also need to pay attention to how we are defining birth in our studies and describing birth. There are lots of terms for birth. So some people may say uh, natural birth, normal birth, but they're the operationalization of these um, terms vary greatly. So some people could say a natural birth is, is something with an intervention. A natural birth just means coming out of a vagina. Um, so we really need to learn, uh, we really need to be very careful in how we're describing birth in terms of these, these uh, definitions. And 
um, I think uh, we really need to start looking more closely at physiological birth. So just to describe what physio physiological birth is, this is the definition by ACOG, um, which says physio physiological births are those that occur without medical intervention. Labor begins spontaneously, proceeds without pharma pharma pharmacologic or surgical assistance, and culminates with a spontaneous vaginal birth. And I'll just add a further definition by Dr. Rachel Reed, who's a researcher in midwifery. She says that this is a birth that involves a woman laboring and birthing her baby in a healthy and uncomplicated way without interventions that auto alter the functioning of her body. So she um, argues to also include uh, laboring in that. So I just want to highlight um, a commentary that I'm, I'm glad this was not written by me because I think that I have my own personal bias, biases and I'll talk about this further, but I suggest anyone interested in this topic read, read this commentary. It's titled, We Do Not Know How People Have Babies, an opportunity for epidemiologists to have meaningful impact on popula population level health and well-being. So they talk in this essay about how and why we should study physiological birth. And I agree with them on a lot of what they say in this commentary. Um, one thing, a, a huge caveat here is that particularly in westernized countries, we don't see physiological birth anymore. Um, maybe it's rare, maybe it's 5%. Um, so it's it's pretty rare to actually see this, especially in the hospital, because there are so many interventions um, and because there are so many, uh, the, there's a widespread of medicalization of birth. So I think if we move forward into this, it's gonna be a challenge. Um, we're gonna have to look at uh, other birthing environments, particularly birthing centers, um, which for example, and then that, they're in, in birthing at home, which is uh, widespread in some places like the Netherlands, um, in Switzerland, where I am, it's very, very low. It's about two to three percent of women who give birth outside of the hospital, so it would be kind of rare. Um, and in this commentary, I love that the authors say it requires a mind shift for the researcher. And so I am going to expose myself in that I've been working in perinatal epidemiology for almost a decade. I was looking at environmental nutritional factors in relation to birth outcomes. And then I worked in within the exosome, all within causal inference. And I treated birth as binary. I'm guilty. I'm, I'm very, very guilty. And I admit it. <laughs> and because I didn't think it mattered, I thought that it was a variable and that it wouldn't affect my estimates. And maybe it didn't, depending on the causal question. But before I gave birth to my first baby, pictured here, I decided to breathe, eat, sleep birth, where I started to study um, physiology, biology, um, how I would feel, what environments promoted the, the, the best outcomes, et cetera. I mean, I, it just, every day I was, I was into the, the literature <clears throat> and I learned so much, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> I learned so much that I didn't ever learn as a perinatal epidemiologist. And I trained at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, um, <clears throat> and then did my postdoc at Imperial. So I did very strong training in the area, um, but I never came across the term physiological birth. I didn't really know what, it, what birth was. <clears throat> and after I had my first baby, I thought, oh my gosh, everything I've been doing is wrong <laughs> uh, in terms of my research. And then I thought, um, why don't more women experience this? Because it was the most beautiful, uh, life-changing experience I've ever had. And I gave birth out of hospital at a, a birthing house in Switzerland for my first and at home for my second. And <clears throat> then when I gave birth to my second, I started to really uh, immerse myself into birth education courses. I started actually collaborating with midwives and it has just really expanded my, my work as a perinatal epidemiologist. And so I argue that if we're working in perinatal epidemiology, if we're working with birth at all, even if you're just working with it as a variable, 
involve someone who knows something about it. And I guarantee your research questions will improve or expand, or you may have a mind shift. Um, yeah, that's my little tangent. <laughs> um, lastly, a little caveat. <clears throat> I say mode of delivery, and we say mode of delivery a lot, but um, it's also thought that pizzas are delivered and babies are birthed. So we can, can start to change the language regarding um, that. And I really, <clears throat> I want to thank you all for um, listening to this talk. And I look forward to the discussion um, and to, to keep this, this, this topic going. I'm working on a, a commentary um, uh, to publish this. And uh, you can contact me. I'm giving my personal email. I'm a researcher at the Institute of Social and Preventive Medicine, part time, 50%. But I'm probably leaving in December, and I'm going to really focus more on my consulting business. So you can find that here at my website. I collaborate with all sorts of researchers, uh, epidemiologists, and doctors, and um, public health specialists, and NGOs. Um, so, yeah, I'd love to work with you if you ever find the need. And sometimes I post on social media. Um, I'm trying to work on, um, yeah, so us getting out there and educating the public about epidemiology. Um, but I, I have a love-hate relationship with social media, so I'm not always there. But sometimes there's some good stuff. So, okay. And with that, uh, I look forward to more discussions. Um,